Hey guys, uh, it's Bizak Claus uh, welcoming you to this online virtual Wednesday night break. Hope everyone's having a good time. It's going to be a great night, um, but before we begin, I got a few announcements for you. First off, summer camp. Get excited. Woo! Uh, there will be a few promotional videos coming out soon, which will give you some more information. Um, but I want to remind you to go ahead and check your email. There's going to be some registration information in there that you need to take a look at and understand. Um, and also, guys, sign up quick. The space is limited. Um, so get ready for that, get excited, but make sure to get some stuff done. Secondly, Mason Jandro, uh, informational meeting for his theology class was on Monday. If you were there, great. If you missed it, no worries, and you still want to join, reach out to Jonathan or Mason. They can get you some more information and get you involved. So guys, tonight we have Joseph Patel leading us in worship. We have Mason bringing us the word. It's going to be a great night. Hope you're ready. Hi, everyone. It's great to kind of be with you right now and to have worship together. Um, this first song is going to be Be Near. Um, I'm Joseph, and uh, this is Hannah and Reese, and we're very happy to get to be here to uh, help lead in worship um, and continue to worship our great God. So let's go ahead and uh, sing this song, Be Near. Dark is light to you, and depths are high to you. Far is near, but Lord, I need to hear from you. Be near, O oh God, be near, O oh God of us, you're near. This is to us a good. Be near, O oh God. more than a page to feel your embrace. The dark is light to you, depths are high to you, far is near, but Lord, I need to hear from you. Be near, oh God, be near, oh God. Next song is Life Defined. Let's go ahead and continue to sing together. Oh, be 
My heart grows cold. When my heart grows cold and my flesh is failing, the spirit is willing to point me back to you. For to live is Christ and to die is better. Help me remember the song. body broken for me remember his approval he gave his life to say so remember his appealing my Lord is in to next song is Psalm 46. Lord, let's pray. Let's continue in singing. Oh, come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. O mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the Shelter with us in. 
sins roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind, ways that makes my heart be still. When the earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage, you know my God is in control. Sins roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. The earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage, I know my God is in control. final song is you love my heart to death let's go ahead and uh, sing this through it's taken me some time to believe You said it's done, it's what you mean. And when they drove the nails through your hands, you would deny you cared, but then they'd take you back. Oh, I drank the cup of death, it's running through my veins. I chose my pride.
Hey, KSM, uh, I hope everyone is, is doing well uh, during this quarantine time still. I cannot believe that this is our eighth uh, virtual Wednesday night break. If you would have told me that we were going to have eight virtual Wednesday night breaks, I probably would have told you you were crazy. But here we are, continuing strong. And uh, tonight, I will be speaking on the, the spiritual discipline of serving, serving God and serving others. Um, we will be, again, hopping around the Bible a lot uh, today and uh, to see what God's word says regarding serving him and others. And I pray that this sermon would be a, a challenge to you, but also encouragement to your soul and, and to know what, what the Bible says regarding the service uh, to God and others. Uh, so if you do want to get a head start, please turn your Bibles to, to Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, while you're turning there, let me uh, pray. Father, I, I thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity again to, to preach your word. Uh, to preach about serving, what it means to, to die to ourselves and to know that, that, Father, we are on this earth to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to glorify you and to serve you in doing it and, and to serve others. And I pray that this uh, sermon would be challenging, but also another encouragement through another discipline that we will be going through and that we may apply it to our lives and continue to serve the God who is worthy to be praised and worthy to be served. We thank you for everything that you do in our lives, and I pray for today that you would speak through me, use your spirit, and um, guide this message to, uh, to be an encouragement to others. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was reading um, his book, More Than a Conqueror, Five Pathways to Personal Revival, author Tai Tamasaka writes regarding serving the mission of Jesus Christ, saying, when it comes to engaging in the mission of Jesus Christ, don't wait until you think you're ready. If you do, you will wait forever. God loves to work through people who are unqualified and feel they are not ready. I love what George Whitfield said. I am immortal until God calls me home. When you step out in faith to engage in the mission of Jesus Christ, you need to understand that biblically there is no small service to God. All service given to him is of great and significant value. Whenever you serve others, you're actually serving God. You are being his hands. You are engaging in his mission. Charles Spurgeon said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. End quote. A couple weeks ago, Dr. John MacArthur had a Q&A for all the semi seminary students. And he quoted George Whitfield regarding serving during this COVID. And, and he, he, he expressed the, uh, the quote of, 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 we are immortal until God is finished with us, until he calls us home, and that we may give our all to him to know that we are on this earth to serve our God. Now, I would say that too many times we fall prey to having too small a vision when it comes to serving. We tend to think more about what, what we accomplished rather than what, what God wants accomplished. And we think more about what our schedules can maintain rather than what, the, uh, what God has on the agenda. Serving God is not a job for the casually interested. It is a costly service. God asks for your life. He requires that, that service to him become a priority, not a pastime. He doesn't want a servant who, who offers him the leftovers of the other commitments that uh, he or she has. In, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously states, when Christ calls a man or a woman, he bids him or her to come and die. I wanted to start this sermon off this way to show you that, that serving is hard. You've got to give your all to it. And it's going to cost you everything you have, whether that be on the mission field, or whether that be right in your backyard, in your community, or your church. God calls for everything, and not not whatever portion you're willing to give, but all of you to serve him and to serve others. So I want to talk about four different aspects of serving tonight. The why and the how will be intertwined within the two, especially in the last one for the how. Uh, but these four will be helpful uh, for you guys looking forward to, to serving the church and your community. Number one, every Christian is expected to serve. Number two, every Christian needs the right motivation to serve. Number three, every Christian is gifted to serve. And number four, every Christian finds ways to serve. Four aspects. 
So let's jump in with the little time that we have. Number one, every Christian is expected to serve. Just like you're expected to pray, you're expected to serve. Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 14, says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? When God calls his elect to himself, he calls no one to idleness. He, he erases that conscience of, of sin and dead works, and he brings alive a Christian who wants to serve him and others. When we are born again, uh, when we are forgiven, God cleanses us. And through that cleansing, we serve him. The Bible exhorts believers to, to serve the Lord with gladness, as Psalm 100, verse 2 says. We see that God's word has, has no place for, for spiritual unemployment or, or spiritual retirement, but a giving of oneself to the Lord and his people. So number one, it's very short, but it's very impactful. Every Christian is expected to serve. That's number one. Number two, we're going to spend a lot of our time here, but this is very important. Every Christian needs the right motivation to serve. If you serve just to do it, that's not the correct motivation. We need all to have the right motivation to serve the Lord. Uh, the Bible talks at least about, uh, talks about at least six um, motives for serving. One, obedience. Two, gratitude. Three, gladness. Four, forgiveness, not guilt. Five, humility. And six, love. Six motives that, that we should have, and I don't want you to take it from my words, but I want you to take it from what the Bible says about serving God and others. So number one, we need to be motivated to serve by obedience. Turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 13, and it, we're going to start in, in verse 4, which says, You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to to him. Moses gives a cluster of commands here, and in the midst of that cluster, we find the mandate to serve him, serve God. We should serve the Lord because he commands it of us. For example, if there were two angels and God went to them and said, this angel, you will be the ruler of the grandest empire, and that's how you are going to serve me. And to another angel, you are going to serve me the way by street, sweeping the streets of, of the meanest and worst village in that same empire. Can you imagine one of those angels refusing God? It's unthinkable. How can, how can any professing Christian, now likewise, if any professing Christian think it's acceptable to sit on the sidelines and watch while the kingdom of God is at work and people are working in it? Any true Christian would say, above all, that he or she wants to obey God. Uh, but we disobey God, and we do not actively serve him. Uh, we sin when we refuse to serve God. So Christian, do you serve God at all? And if you do, or have you served out of obedience or out of obligation, do you serve because it's commanded of you, or do you serve because your friend's going to be there? Uh, the Bible tells us that we need to be motivated to serve by obedience and because God has commanded it of us. That's number one. Number two, we need to be motivated to serve with gratitude. With gratitude. If you just turn your Bibles a couple of chapters over, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24 says, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. When serving God seems like a burden, brother and sister, remember what the great things that he has done for you, and that will destroy that burden. Do you remember what it was like to not know Christ, uh, to be without God and without hope? And do you remember how it feels to be guilty before God and unforgiven? And do you look back at the horror that could have been that you were a breath away from spending eternity in hell? Now... Do you remember the experience of seeing Jesus Christ for who he is and understanding for the first time his life, death, and resurrection? Do you remember the joy of your first awareness of that, of, of forgiveness and deliverance from hell and the judgment? 
Do you understand now of the assurance of heaven and eternal life? When the desire to serve God grows cold, remember what great things he has done for you in Jesus Christ. I love this illustration by Donald Whitney in his Spiritual Disciplines book. He says, suppose God put $10 million into your bank account every day for the rest of your life, but didn't save you. Uh, He gave you the most beautiful body and face that never aged, yet when you die, he shut you out of heaven and, and sends you to hell for eternity. Now my question to you is, what has God ever given anyone that can compare with the salvation he has given to you as a believer? Do you see that God could never do anything for you or give anything better to you than the gift of himself? I understand, guys, that this is not easy. It's $10 million every single day. But when, we, when you put it up against knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, these things don't seem like anything. Because knowing Christ and him saving us is the best gift we could ever be given. And I pray that we would have gratitude to serve him when our love to serve grows cold. So that's number two, with gratitude. Number three, we need to be motivated to serve God with gladness. Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 100, verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. God expects his servants to serve, not grudgingly or grimly or glumly, but gladly. Like, I can understand why the person who serves out of obligation doesn't serve with gladness. It's like chores. I got to do it. You're not glad to do it. You're just out of obligation. I have to do it. I understand why a person who who serves a God to think that this is my attempt to earn my way into salvation doesn't serve with gladness. It's the same thing as chores. Okay, I have chores. I get an allowance. I don't, I'm not enjoying it, but I know I get the allowance, so I'm just going to go do it. You're only doing it for the prize. You're not doing it for the person. But the Christian who gratefully acknowledges what God has done for him or her for eternity should be able to serve, serve God gladly and cheerfully with joy. It's not a burden to serve. It, it's a privilege. And suppose God, uh, let me ask you, lets you choose Anyone in the world to serve and know intimately, but wouldn't let you serve him. Or suppose he permitted you to serve yourself, doing anything you wanted, with no needs or any anxieties, uh, but you would never know Jesus Christ. As Christians, when you think about these things, these things become miserable in comparison to the immeasurable privilege of serving God and knowing Jesus Christ. That's why in Psalm 84, verse 10, it says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So I ask you, Christian, do you serve the church with gladness or with gloom? Do you serve your neighbors or friends willingly or reluctantly? Do people around you get the sense that you love to serve? As Christians, we must be motivated to serve with gladness. Number four, we need to be motivated to serve God through his forgiveness, not guilt. Turn your Bibles one book over to, or two books over to Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 6. Isaiah's response to once God has forgiven him, read this. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. We see here that Isaiah is straining to serve the Lord in some way or any way. Because he's guilty? No, because his guilt was taken away. In his sermon... On September 8th, 1867, Charles Spurgeon put service to God in perspective, saying, quote, The child of God works not for life, but from life. He does not work to be saved. He works because he is saved. End quote. 
as people of God, we do not serve him in order to be forgiven. We serve him because we are forgiven. What a joy to know that. We don't need to act like like grudging prisoners or or sentenced prisoners or, or begrudgingly. His death, Jesus Christ's death, freed us from guilt. Oh, what a joy. May we be motivated to serve God, guiltless before the throne of God. So I ask you, Christian, do you serve out of guilt? Do you serve begrudgingly, or do you serve willingly because your guilt has been taken away? Jesus came to take away the sins of the world so that we may not sulk in them and serve him with forgiveness and gladness and gratitude and obedience. Number five, we need to be motivated to serve God with humility. So uh, turn your Bibles to John chapter 13. I think we can all agree that, that, that Jesus was the, the most perfect and, and greatest servant uh, ever. Uh, he revealed his, his meekness and, and greatness and lowliness as, as he served his 12 friends uh, by washing their feet. Even though he even, he even knew that one of them was going to betray him and he still served him. So in, in John chapter 13, starting in verse 12, it says, So when he had washed their feet and taken his garment and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. With such humility, Jesus, the Lord and teacher, washed his disciples' feet for an example for all of his followers to to serve and should serve in humility. In this world, us Christians, we battle with sin. We battle with, with a thing called the flesh. And it, and it tells us that if, if I have to serve, I want to get something for it. If I can be rewarded or gain a reputation of humility, then I'll serve. I know we have all thought about this once. I have. I'm guilty of this, and it is a sin that uh, was needed of repentance. And if you are struggling with that also, repent, brother or sister, for that. Because it's hypocritical service. It's not about getting recognition from others, but only from the one true God. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us reject self-righteousness. Hypocritical service is is sinful. It's a sinful motivation. And help us to, to, to serve with humility, considering others more significant, as Philippians 2, 3 says. My question to you is can you serve your, your friends and, and be happy when they get rewarded and you get overlooked? Can, can you work to make others look good without envy filling your heart? Can you serve the church and those in need without getting recognition? And I'm not saying getting recognition or getting rewards or getting money is, is wrong, but if that's your motive, uh, you've got to check your heart in that. If God places you in any of these sish- in any of these situations, will you, like your master Jesus Christ, serve for years in your own village carpentry shop if he wants you to be there to grow in godliness and grow in a deeper understanding of him? God not only looks for a job well done, the world looks for that too. You know, the world does things for a job well done. But he calls us to serve with humility because that is what leads us to look more like his son. May we be motivated to serve God with humility. And lastly, we need to be motivated to serve God in love. In love. Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, starting in, in verse 3. It says this, or verse 13, apologize. For you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. No fuel for service burns longer and provides more energy than love. There was a missionary in Africa 
who was asked if he really liked what he was doing, and his response was, was shocking. Do I like this work, he said? No, my wife and I do not like crawling in dirt. Who likes crawling in dirt? Uh, we don't like crawling in, in vile poop, goat poop, while we, we crawl through huts. Who likes that? But is a man to do nothing for Christ he does not like? God, pity him. If, if not, liking or disliking has nothing to do with it. We have orders to go, and we go. Love constrains us. When Christ's love controls or constrains people, they no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Jesus says in Matthew 22, verses 36 to 39, the greatest commandment is to love God with everything. The next most important one is to love your neighbor as yourself. In light of these words, surely the more we love God, the more we will live for him and serve him. And the more we love others, the more we will also serve them. Let us be motivated to serve God in love. So there's six things, and that was number two. Every Christian, I know it's longer, but needs the right motivation to serve. you got to have the right motivation to serve. Number three, every Christian is gifted to serve. We're going to talk about two phrases here. One, spiritual gifts. Uh, what are they? What do they look like? Number two, hard work. Okay. If you turn your, your Bibles to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, um, it says that, that, that as the Holy Spirit comes within you, um, he brings a gift or gifts with him. We read in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and verse 11, uh, different varieties of gifts that the Holy Spirit determines by his sovereign will. He chooses to give each believer. Uh, if you look at, at chapter 12, verse 4, it says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. In verse 11, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. And, and also we see it in 1 Peter 4.10, it says that each Christian receives a special gift, a gift intended for use in service, saying, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I understand that, that spiritual gifts are a controversy topic, and I'm not going to sit here and, and talk about that. That's for another sermon. But I, there are two different things, two important things, should I say, that, that I want to address with spiritual gifts. One, if you are a Christian, you definitely have at least one of these gifts, because the Bible tells us. And number two, God gave you the gift for the purpose that you serve him with it. For his kingdom, period. Two things, for sure, not even a question. But I want to ask you, do you know your spiritual gift? If you don't, that's totally okay. And I would, I would implore you to search the scriptures and try to find it. But what I would say is that if you want to find out what your spiritual gift is, you need to go serve. That's how God reveals it to you also. At the end of the day, God gives spiritual gifts for use in service. If he intended no use for your gift, then there would be no longer any purpose for you on this life. This is George Whitfield said. I am immortal until God is done with me. He gives he gifts each believer and keeps each believer alive to use him or her for his purposes until he calls us home. Figure out what your spiritual gift is and and, and love it and enjoy it and use it for God's kingdom. That's number one. Number two, hard work. Hard work. We're gifted to serve, but it's hard work. Some teach that once you discover your spiritual gift, then serving becomes such a joy. Oh, I can serve now. I know my spiritual gift. And that's not New Testament Christianity. I'm sorry. Just that burst in your bubble. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 4.12 about the equipping of the saints for the work of the service. Sometimes serving God and others is nothing less than hard work. Most of Paul's letters start with uh, a servant of God, as in Romans and Philippians. In Colossians 1.29, he says, For this purpose I also labor, or I also toil, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. The word labor, or the word toil, in some translations, means uh, that, that to work to a point of exhaustion. 
Now, that doesn't mean that, that Paul's work was miserable toil or labor. In fact, the reason Paul worked so hard was because the only thing he loved more than serving God was God himself. Likewise, Jesus himself in, in John 34 found the work of serving God as his food. Love that. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Donald Whitney, in his great discipline uh, book, writes this. It's so, it really is convicting and great. He says, serving God sometimes so physically exhausted Jesus that he could sleep in a boat even as waves crashed over the side. It once meant 40 days without eating. For Jesus, service meant frequent nights of sleeping outside on the ground. It meant getting up before uh, daylight to have any time alone. But in the midst of all weariness, hunger, thirst, pain, and inconvenience, Jesus said that the work of serving God was so fulfilling that it was like food. It nourished him. It strengthened him. It satisfied him. He devoured it. Serving God is hard work, but there's no work more gratifying. I'll tell you that. So I encourage you with 1 Corinthians 15, 58, which says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Your toil is never in vain, brother and sister. God sees and knows all your service, and to him, he will never forget it. He will reward you in heaven, and it will be a joy. I love Hebrews 6.10, it says, For God is not unjust to us to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and still ministering to the saints. He will never forget. Disciplined service to God is work, hard and costly labor sometimes, but it will endure for all eternity. When you go home and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Every Christian is gifted to serve. That's number three. Number four, last one. Every Christian finds ways to serve. I understand that uh, you could have a whole sermon on this. Ways. There's so many ways to serve the Lord. But I've only got a little time to show some practical uh, application to how you can serve the Lord. But uh, two ways I found in, in, in the church and in your community for you guys. Serving may be as public as, as preaching, like what I'm doing, or teaching. But more often, it will be hidden as working in the nursery. It may be as visible as leading worship, but usually it will go unnoticed as someone working the sound booth to amplify that worship. Serving may be as appreciated as giving a testimony on, on Sunday or, or Wednesday or at camp, but typically it's as thankless as, as setting up chairs and, and, or, or stacking chairs for a church event or after a church event. Only the eye of God sees the larger hidden part of service. And obviously I understand this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to service to God. But I love what Jesus says in, in Matthew 10. He says, and whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. You don't need to serve in, in massive ways in the church. Little ways are still looked at as, as beautiful ways to serve our Lord and Savior. So that's in the church, in the community, beyond the church wall. Serving can manifest itself in babysitting for people or for your neighbors. Uh, taking meals to families that are struggling. Running errands for people who, who can't run errands or aren't physically able. Providing transportation to people who, whose cars break down. Helping people with their lawns and their gardens. Feeding or babysitting pets, gardening, watering plants. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff you could do for people. But the hardest of all, right now in this time, is serving at your home. Serving your parents, serving your siblings when they're driving you insane. I understand, I've been there. Serving typically looks as unspectacular as the practical needs it seeks to meet. And that is why serving is a spiritual discipline. It's a discipline. I wouldn't be talking about it if it wasn't. It's hard work, but oh, is it joyful and gratifying 
to see what Jesus Christ has done for us and to work for him through that. So as Christians, we are expected to serve. We need the right motivation to serve. We are gifted to serve. and We find ways to serve. To finish here, I want to tell you, KSM, how encouraged I am by you in your service. Leaders and students. Uh, at church, in your community, VBS, mission trips. What a joy it's been to be here for just a couple months to see that we have staff and students that love the Lord and love to serve the Lord. Makes me so happy to see that. And I want to encourage you guys and challenge you to, to strive and keep going. Understand that your life is not yours and, and God has given you this amazing life to serve him and to use your gifts for that. Do it out of the right motivation, out of obedience and gratitude, gladness and humility, forgiveness, not guilt, and love. Oh, and may you see the kingdom of God expound to the glory of God. This is the spiritual discipline of service. Our goal is that we become more like Jesus Christ. That is our goal in this life, to glorify God and become more like his son. And yet, like Jesus, no matter how much public recognition we gain in the church or in the community, God calls us of times in service in the shadows as well. Regardless of your gifts or talents, determine to use them for Christ and his kingdom. Jerry Wright writes, for most Christians, serving requires a conscious effort. Cautious effort, that's what I said. No, conscious, that was good. Or to put it another way, serving requires discipline. Let's pray. Father, I, I love you. Oh, I, I thank you for, uh, for your beauty and your glory and you giving me and, and us the ability to serve you. A job that I think we take for granted a lot that we're able to do that. And I pray that we wouldn't take it, uh, take it for granted. That we would look it straight in the eye and know that this is a wonderful thing, wonderful gift that we have been given. Now, Father, wait. May we serve you in all that we have. May we not look at this life as ours, but may we look at this life to, to serve you first and foremost and to serve others as importantly. We love you. We thank you. And I pray that you would continue to, to use this youth group and use this church for your glory and for the service of you and others. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, thanks again for joining us for Wednesday Night Break, digital edition. Uh, now you should be getting with your small groups and some sort of a digital small group. So contact your leader if you're not sure how to do that. And we always want to remind you, if you feel like, hey, you want some extra care, you need someone to talk to, we're here for you. You can email me at jclub at kindredchurch.org. You can call the office. You got my cell phone most likely. Or get in touch with your small group leaders. We want to make sure you feel really well loved and taken care of. Hopefully this is almost over, but until then, uh, we're praying for you. We'll see you again next week.